Jules. All right. Good day to you all. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, it's actually the uh, coldest day of the winter so far here in Boulder. Uh, I'm glad to be inside where it's where it's warm. It's quite cold outside. It's about uh, negative two right now. Uh, so hopefully it's a little bit warmer wherever you are. Uh, what I wanted to do today is share with you the results of a project that I and a bunch of collaborators have been involved in for oh, the past eight years or so. And we call it the Social Reactors Project. Uh, bef before getting into uh, uh, more of the details, I just wanted to uh, thank many of the key people that have participated in the project over the years. Now, I, I, I was hesitant to make a, a slide like this because, you know, we've had many, many uh, collaborators on specific projects that are not listed here, but, uh, but these folks have been involved uh, uh, in, on a number of projects that we've done. Uh, including graduate students at the University of Colorado and uh, Arizona State University and, and, uh, and folks uh, abroad uh, in other countries as well. Uh, the, uh, the, the key ideas for the, for the project emerged from conversations between myself, Jose Lobo, Luis Betancourt, and Mike Smith, who were shown here. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, we've brought a bunch of other people in uh, to help us uh, expand and elaborate on these ideas. Uh, here are some of the guiding questions that we've been pursuing on this project uh, that we think we have some interesting answers to. Um, so, of course, we know that, you know, human societies are really complicated and complex, and we know that lots of things happen in them. Uh, but are there fundamental social processes that are always going on in human societies? Could we identify them, uh, give them names, uh, think about their dynamics, how they work? Uh, can we generalize about them? Uh, of course, we all also know that in, in detail, you know, human behavior is, is very difficult to predict. It's very sort of chaotic when viewed in detail. Uh, is there, are there senses in which human behavior though actually becomes predictable when you look at it in certain ways, at a certain altitude? With a certain degree of abstraction, uh, when you do that, you know, is it a level of abstraction that is banal? You know, so that the the generalizations are so simple that it's not even interesting. Or is there a level at which you can make interesting generalizations um, uh, about human behavior that are predictable? Humans are social animals. We live in uh, in societies, in social networks, what we call human networks, and there's a sense in which the kinds of networks that we humans form today are different from those of the past. Well, but how exactly? And in what ways have human networks evolved over the course of the human career? Uh, also, you know, a number of archaeologists, me included, have been making arguments in recent years that uh, part of the maturation of our field as it continues to develop is for archaeologists to make increasing contributions to discussions of contemporary social issues. Uh, so uh, in what ways can archaeology contribute to uh, those kinds of discussions? And in what ways do, do knowledge of human networks uh, help with that? And finally, you know, I think one of the really big patterns in uh, human history overall is that the scale of human societies, the number of people participating in human societies and human groups more generally, and, uh, and the number of people that live together in settlements uh, has grown by many orders of magnitude over time. Our, our primate uh, relatives don't form you know, troops of more than, uh, best maybe a baboon troop might have uh, maybe a few hundred individuals in it. Um, for most of human history, the, the daily group that human beings lived in was a, was a kin-based group of maybe a few dozen people. And today, most of humanity lives in uh, urbanized areas of hundreds of thousands to millions of people. Uh, so, and in the big picture, that process has been happening somewhat inexorably for a very long period of time. Uh, and so why is that? Is there an underlying reason why uh, the scale and scope of human agglomeration has been increasing inexorably over time. Our approach to these questions um, focuses on, as you might have guessed, 
human networks and their evolution, the fundamental processes behind them. Uh, we, we think that ideas coming out of something called spatial equilibrium in economic geography are important for thinking about the properties of these networks and how they work. Uh, our approach does focus on making predictions, specific predictions about the properties of these networks uh, and how they change uh, over time. Our approach focuses on what we might call emergent properties of human networks. Things, properties of these networks that change as they grow and get larger uh, or with what we would call the scale of the network. And we are interested in general theory, which is to say a theory of human networks that transcends the past and present applies to human societies full stop. Not necessarily, so we often like to say that we're not, although we might be using archeological evidence to do this work, we're not necessarily learning about the past. We're learning about human networks and how they work. Now, what our approach is not necessarily about, and th these are some points about which there's been some confusion uh, in, in the past is, Although we use data from settlements and cities as convenient units for measuring the properties of human networks, our approach is not necessarily about cities. Now, although a lot of the key ideas I'll be talking about did emerge from, uh, from folks that were interested in cities and that were studying the properties of cities, what we found is that our approach is not necessarily about cities or even settlements per se. It really is about human networks. Our approach also is not necessarily about the specific details of what happens in any particular place or in any particular society. Again, what we're trying to do is look at a pretty high altitude and generalize uh, how human societies work overall, hopefully in ways that are interesting and not, again, not banal. Um, there is, of course, a long tradition of seeking to create uh, mathematical models of uh, human affairs in economics. Uh, and many of those have utilized the concept of the utility function. Uh, one thing we wanted to point out is that utility functions are not involved uh, in our approach. Um, although you can, in a sense, develop, derive the approach that we take using utility functions, but it's not necessary and it's more complicated when you do. So, um, so our approach does not rely upon neoclassical economic theory in that way. Uh, our approach is about patterns in human networks and not about necessarily the detailed properties of a specific human network. So um, although we think our approach is useful for thinking about average results of changes in the character of human networks in a society, uh, we don't necessarily think you can predict in detail what will happen in a specific place as a result of these processes. There's many other things involved in the than the processes that we are looking at. Our approach is not about market capitalism. Uh, in a way, you could say market capitalism would be a special case of the operation of the processes that we're, in, we're talking about in this project. Uh, and although we are interested in abstraction and in generalization, uh, I would say that we're not necessarily being reductionist in this approach. What, what we're doing is, directly measuring uh, properties of human networks and abstracting generalizations from those. But that doesn't mean that the details of the individual cases goes away. Uh, in many ways, what I would say is our approach provides a, a means of controlling for the effects of scale for the properties of human networks so that other things about them become a bit easier to see. So the framework of, of this project is something we call scaling analysis. Uh, and I'm going to be showing you a lot of plots that look like this in the talk. So if you just look at these plots here, um, you'll see that in general, the x-axis is going to be some measure of population. Uh, in this case, we're looking at data from uh, U.S. metropolitan areas from 2006. So this would be a census population of these metropolitan areas. And the y-axis is going to be some other aggregate property of a metro area, a settlement, or something like that. Uh, so each dot in these plots represents, at least in these data, a metro area. Uh, and uh, you'll see that um, both in all of the analyses we're going to do in both cases, the axes are both logarithmic. And what that would mean is that if the, if the data points lined up in a, such a way that the measurement on the y-axis increased proportionately to population, 
the data points would line up along the black lines that you see in these plots here. Uh, so on the left side, you know, those blue dots would line up along the black line there, representing a proportional. So as the population increases in a city today, the number of road miles in the city would increase proportionately to the population. Or on the right, if the GDP of a metro area was proportional to population, you would see those dots line up along the black line. But what you see here is that the, the data don't line up along those lines. Um, the red line is the fit line, the ordinary least squares regression fit uh, to these data. And you can see that the slope of that fit line is different from one. And so the way you think about this is that if the slope is less than one, as you see on the left, uh, it means that the rate of growth of the miles of road in a city is slower than the rate of growth of the population. So essentially what it means is that larger cities can get by with fewer miles of road per person. Uh, there is an economy of scale in the built environments of those cities. And on the flip side, uh, on the right, uh, it shows that the, the slope is greater than one. And what that means is that as the population grows, the, the GDP grows faster than the population. So in uh, US cities today, larger cities produce more, the value of goods and services produced by people in larger cities is higher per capita than it is in smaller cities. So this is the, this is the framework and the phenomenon that we are interested in. And you can see some uh, the equations there that illustrate uh, 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 one of the key points of our, of our work. Uh, you can see the exponent of the, uh, of the fit line there is represented by the uh, one minus delta or the one plus delta next to the n. So a, a case where there are increasing returns to scale, one plus delta is greater than one, that would mean that delta is positive. Uh, and uh, in the case of in infrastructure, if the slope is less than one, then it's one minus delta. Again, delta is some number greater than zero. So over the past uh, eight years or so, we've been Looking at uh, data for human networks from across the world, uh, we've done studies using data from five different continents now. Uh, this is a map illustrating the spatial distribution of the areas that the data we've looked at come from. And I should mention that all, almost all of the uh, results I'm gonna be sharing with you uh, are published uh, and all of the publications of the project are available on the project website that you see here. They're all open access. so. Um, if there are any details of any of the specific studies I'm going to share that you're interested in, you can always go and get the actual publication to look at it. So what have we learned from doing all this work um, over the last uh, eight years? Uh, I want to walk through a, a series of what I think are the most important things that we found. So number one, uh, what we call nonlinear scaling really does seem to be an intrinsic property of human networks. There are many, many, many properties of human networks that exhibit nonlinear in the sense that they, their rate of growth with population is not proportional. They're either faster or slower. Uh, this is uh, some results from a study we did recently where we summarized uh, a bunch of archeological studies looking at the relationship between estimates of the population and the aerial extent of settlements in a wide variety of societies, new world and old world, you can see here. Uh, Basin of Mexico in the towns and also the, the dispersed farming settlements there, uh, classic Maya settlements, uh, Northern China in uh, the Neolithic and Bronze Age, the uh, coastal Peruvian river valley, uh, the Azapa culture of Mexico, uh, medieval Europe and in the 13th century, uh, highland Peru in the Montaro Valley, the uh, middle Missouri river drainage of the Dakotas in the US, the Mesa Verde region in Southwest Colorado, the Roman Empire uh, across the Mediterranean basin, and uh, an area called the Mixteca Alta in Oaxaca in Mexico. You can see that in all of these cases, uh, there is a strong relationship between the population and area of, of the settlements. Uh, on the right side of the slide, what I'm gonna, this is another version of these results I'm going to show you where the, the top plot there where it says beta that is a, uh, this illustrates the estimate of the exponent of the relationship between population and area in this case. Uh, so you can see that 
for the majority of these cases, that exponent is, is quite a bit less than one and somewhere around two thirds. There's a few where the exponent is around uh, five, six, 0.8 or so. And then there's a couple that are beyond that range that uh, are sort of outliers actually in this analysis. And keep those in mind, I'll come back to them a little bit later. Uh, but you can see that hardly any of these have, are the, you know, have a situation where a population is proportional to uh, area uh, or area is proportional to population. I mean, perhaps the dispersed settlements in the basin of Mexico are the closest to that, but even there, they're not really. Uh, so these nonlinear relationships between aggregate properties of human settlements and the networks that they incorporate uh, are, seem to be intrinsic and very, very widespread. And the fact that so many of them occur within that relatively narrow range that I've shown you there on the slide in the upper right uh, is important. And it tells you something uh, about their consistency uh, that is our second main point. So our second major thing that I think we've learned is that I think we have a good reason for why these nonlinear uh, relationships are so widespread. And here's how we describe what we think is driving it in words. Uh, when people arrange themselves uh, in settlements, what they're doing is arranging themselves in ways that balance the benefits of the interactions that they have with their friends and neighbors in the settlement uh, with the costs of moving around to do it. Uh, so uh, as we all know, we benefit from interacting with others. We get lots of what we need from other people, but we have to physically go, go there to get it. Uh, and I'm not just talking about social interaction in the sense of what we're doing right now, talking on Zoom. I'm talking about the physical transfer of goods and services, energy and other things that people need to keep going. Um, you know, I still have to go to the market and get food and cook it for me to be able to keep processing and talking to you on Zoom. And so that's the more fundamental uh, dimension of this process than just talking over the internet. So this balancing process of costs and benefits uh, of interaction ends up concentrating social contacts in space and time. And what happens here is that the socioeconomic rates that occur that emerge from the from human settlements are proportional to the interaction rates that concentrate as uh, as people arrange themselves in this way. A as the number of people that are arranging themselves in space grows, the number of people that they can interact with grows faster than the number of people. Their, the connectivity of the average person rises exponentially. And as a result, people get more of what they want and also, of course, what they don't want through their social context. So more of what they want, food, clothing, other manufactured goods, information, friendship, uh, love, fun, entertainment, and also things that they don't want, like disease, crime, uh, and so forth, uh, through their social context. So what ends up happening overall is that as the size of a human network grows, it gets increasingly concentrated in space, it gets uh, more connected, interactions happen faster, and it means that an, an individual gets more of what they need through their contacts, which means they don't have to do as much of it themselves. Uh, and so as a result, individuals can specialize more in how they spend their time doing things. Uh, and the total stock of information, knowledge, and other things grows uh, with that process. All right? So in words, this is what we think is the fundamental process that's going on and that generates these nonlinear scaling relationships. And we've translated into mathematics. Um, Luis Betancourt, our collaborator, uh, made the initial moves in this area, and we have continued uh, to uh, build upon and elaborate on, on his work. Uh, so this is a, a graphical representation of how we would turn the same process into a mathematical framework. First of all, you think about the cost of a group of people in space being able to mix together over time. That cost would be set by the uh, diameter of the area over which the people are distributed, because that's the farthest a person has to walk to be able to access everyone that's there. So that would be, uh, you know, that cost would increase proportionally proportionately to the square root of the area, right? Or the linear dimension of the area uh, multiplied by the cost of travel, that epsilon that you see there in the top uh, equation there. Now, the interactions that a person has within this kind of space would be set by uh, basically the path that they take during the day, uh, the green path L, uh, the width of that path, basically how close you have to get to someone to talk to them, and so you could think of that as making a, 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 
a, a, a shape with an area to it. The area covered by a person's travel during the day is a subset of the overall area where all the people are. Uh, and so they're, on average, their contacts would be basically that area times the density of people over that space. So that's what you see in the second line there. Now you could think about that there's a, a, a average net benefit of interactions that comes uh, from all of this. And we add this factor G to the equation to say, okay, so there's some net benefit to an individual of those interactions that occur. Uh, and that leads to that relation where we get Y, which is the uh, outcomes or benefits of the interaction. So then we can suggest there's a spatial equilibrium, a balancing of costs and benefits. So C equals Y. And when you substitute in the equations from above and simplify, you boil down to this relationship here where it says the expected area of a settlement of a given population N is proportional to some baseline area A uh, times N to the two thirds power. Uh, and if we back up and look at uh, this plot here, you can see that several of the cases that uh, we have through the archeological record have estimates of that exponent, which are right about two thirds. Now we can keep going from here and there are elaborations of this approach uh, that uh, I won't go through here today, but uh, they lead to a mathematical framework that leads to a whole bunch of predictions regarding the uh, ways that the properties of human networks change as they grow as revealed in settlements, which are the essentially the containers within which interactions occur, uh, what we might call the reactors within which the social network operates. And this is where the idea of a social reactor comes from. So number one here is the relationship that we've already, I've already mentioned. Uh, the area is, uh, is uh, equivalent, the estimated area is equivalent to some baseline area times n to the to the two thirds. Uh, we also, through using this sim similar style of, uh, of, uh, uh, of mathematical analysis, uh, we derive a, an, a, a predicted relationship between the infrastructural area, or you might call it the access network area of a city and the population. And there you see that one minus Delta. Uh, the total social connections of the individuals within a settlement of a given population, one plus Delta. Uh, again, the socioeconomic rates would be proportional to the total connections so that the total output or the total rate of any sort of socioeconomic activity in a settlement would increase with n to the one plus delta. Uh, and then uh, finally, the relationship between connectivity and diversity is constant, right? So a person, as they become more connected, can become, quote, less diverse or more specialized. Uh, and as a result, we get a relationship between the diversity of a settlement and the population, and it goes as one minus delta. And in all of these cases, uh, in, under most conditions, the expected value of alpha and delta is uh, two thirds for alpha and one sixth for delta. Uh, so these are specific predictions regarding the mathematical values of these network effects uh, in human settlements. And uh, the result of this modeling effort leads to the conclusion that uh, we th the hypothesis that population, area, infrastructure, connectivity, socioeconomic rates, and the division of labor are all related through this single process. Uh, it's a, it, I realize that it is a pretty bold claim, but I think we have pretty good evidence that, that this is really going on. So our third big... Uh, takeaway from the project is that this social reactor process, process shows up in all sorts of measurements. Um, the analysis here shows you the relationship between proxies for the population and the total area of houses uh, in a whole bunch of different new world societies, uh, mostly pre-Hispanic, uh, but a few uh, in early historical times uh, after European contact. Uh, so, uh, you know, the basin of Mexico, the intersalada region is uh, a portion of uh, northwestern Argentina. The lower Santa Valley is a Peruvian river valley, Mesa Verde region, southwest Colorado. Uh, middle Missouri region is, uh, again, the Dakotas of the U.S. Uh, the Rio Grande Valley is uh, northern New Mexico, and the upper Montaro region is in highland Peru. Uh, so each dot here is a settlement. 
where there's an estimated population based on the number of houses uh, that are present in that settlement. And the uh, y-axis is the total area of those houses. And you can see that the slopes of those relationships are remarkably similar. And you can see the fit lines up in the upper left of the plot. They're all in the neighborhood of 1.15, 1.16, and so on. Uh, now, if you, if, you, if you scale them all to, uh, to adjust for differences in the intercept of uh, the relationship and put them all on the same relative uh, axes and do the analysis again, you get the result at the bottom, uh, which shows that the, uh, the slope of that fit line relating the log of population to the log of house area, which is the same thing as the exponent of the relationship between population and area without taking the log transformation is 1.162. Uh, the expectation of the social reactor process is 1.167. So when you put all this together, your result is within five one thousandths of the expected value. Uh, I think that's just an incredibly amazing result. And the fact that crappy archeological data with all of the caveats that we know exist with it can nevertheless on average show you uh, a result that is so close to an expected value from a mathematical model, I think is just amazing. Uh, so, so this is a case where the relationship between population and house area as a proxy for the productivity of the group show is consistent with expectations. The idea here with house area would be that as people become more connected, uh, they're more productive and they end up having more stuff. They need more space to keep that stuff. And so the houses get a little bit bigger on average. One example. Now, here's some other uh, measures uh, that show the same, same basic result, but you know, through dramatically different means. Uh, at the top, we have uh, the populations and measures of the agricultural outputs of um, agricultural temple communities in Angkor, medieval Angkor in uh, Cambodia. Uh, and you can see that they're, they show increasing returns to scale uh, at, at the level uh, that more or less we expect. Uh, and at the bottom, we have data that show the rate of pottery consumption with population in a series of medieval, and, or sorry, Bronze Age and Neolithic settlements uh, in uh, ancient China. Uh, and once again, pretty much the same result. Uh, so not just house area, but also measures of agricultural productivity and pottery consumption. And here's another example that shows the relationship between the contributing population to the monumental architecture of pre-Columbian uh, New World uh, religious centers and the rate at which that material, those uh, monuments were constructed per year. Uh, so this is three different regions of the new world uh, where you can see that as the size of the network that built those buildings increased, the rate at which the buildings were built increased to the 1.17 power. Uh, amazing uh, that it's so close to the expected value across several different societies. Here again, you can see that we have centered the data. There's a, if we looked at the data raw, we would see that there were different intercepts the height of the scaling relationship would be different for each of these three cases. But when we, when we uh, trans, translate them all to a common relative uh, set of uh, variables, uh, we see uh, this very clear relationship there. All right, the fourth thing that we've learned is that the social reactors process has not always been there. Uh, it does seem to have evolved over time. So the first point we want to make is that we actually do not see the telltale effects of this process in the settle the camp, camps of mobile hunter gatherers. Uh, on the left of this slide, we have an analysis of a global ethnographic database of information from uh, hunters and gatherers from around the world uh, for all but the Northwest Coast. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but if you look at the slope of, of that line, again, log population versus log of area, uh, 1.7 is the slope there, way, way larger than one. What that means is that larger, you know, when more hunters and gatherers camp together, they put more space between each other. As more hunters and gatherers come together, 
those camps get less and less dense. And they de-densify at a pretty rapid pace. Uh, it's kind of uh, an amazing result there. And we see this in the archaeological record as well. Uh, on the left side is an example from uh, a study of teepee ring sites in the state of Wyoming in the U.S. Uh, so these are sites where, uh, where mobile hunters and gatherers had collected uh, large rocks to hold down uh, uh, bison hide tents uh, or teepees um, in their camps. And those, those rings end up sticking around and getting reused when uh, people come and revisit those camps uh, over time. So the, as the number of stone circles, the number of lodges or the number of teepees increases in one of these camps, the area over which they are spread increases faster than the number of circles. And in this case, the slope is about 1.25 or one and a quarter. So not quite as fast as the ethnographic data overall, but still much, much higher than one. Now these data are shown here as bins with a, with a standard deviation because there, there's like 4,000 sites here and it's kind of, there's so much variation, it's hard to see the pattern if you just look at all of the data. Uh, so it's simplified here to help you see it, uh, but it's a really strong relationship and it's uh, super linear. Uh, so larger, the camps of mobile hunters and gatherers are dense uh, when, as they get larger. An exception to this though is uh, the settlements of Northwest Coast people uh, in British Columbia and uh, Washington and Alaska. Uh, and there's a, the ethnographic sample here on the right side again, and you can see that the slope of the relationship between population and area for those uh, villages is much more similar to that of many, many other cases. It's much less than 1.74. So it's within this range between about two thirds and five six uh, that we would expect. Uh, and th this is also interesting because of course, Northwest Coast people were not, did not produce their own food through agriculture at least. Uh, there certainly is literature which and research which suggests that Northwest Coast people intensively manage the salmon runs to improve their productivity. Uh, but, you know, folks have typically considered uh, Northwest Coast people as a hunting and gathering, a complex hunting and gathering society. And they were sedentary populations. Uh, and, and as you can see, in a sedentary hunting and gathering situation, uh, the scaling that we see in more permanent settlements begins to show up. So this suggests that there was what you might consider to be a major transition in the character of human networks that uh, emerged with the process of sedentism, uh, not necessarily with agricultural production, but with sedentism, uh, the formation of permanent settlements. Uh, uh, you know, another way to think is that the fact that these hunters and gatherers do not arrange themselves in camp in ways that lead to uh, densification shows you that they are not arranging themselves with respect to the costs and benefits of interaction with the other people in the camp. Whereas Northwest Coast people seem to have been doing that. So the social reactors process is not primordial. It probably has not been there all along in human societies, but it is something that has emerged as people began to settle down. A second way that the process has evolved uh, over time is that uh, Today, the height of the relationships uh, between population and socioeconomic rates is changing pretty rapidly. Here are some data from uh, contemporary People's Republic of China, uh, urban areas there, which shows the relationship between population and GDP uh, for each year between 1996 and 2015. The yellow uh, circles are the center of the data for each period. So the average of the log population and the average of the log GDP and you can see that over time, that center is migrating around. It's moving. It's moving to the right a little bit uh, because the average, the population of China is growing. But it's also moving up because the baseline productivity of people in China has been increasing over time. But as you can see, looking at the data, the slope of the relationship between population and GDP has been incredibly consistent um, over that period of time. So this is what's happening typically in uh, contemporary societies around the world today. Uh, but what we found is that this was very unusual in past societies. Uh, in many cases that we've been able to look at, the intercepts of these scaling relationships were stable over very long periods of time. And I think this is the clearest example of it. It's using data from the Northern Rio Grande Pueblos in New Mexico. 
Uh, all three, and all three of these, uh, the x-axis is a measure of population. And the y-axis uh, is in A is a measure of consumption, which is the accumulation rate of painted pottery. B is possessions, which is the sizes of houses, or actually the sizes of rooms. Uh, and C is a measure of the diversity of the community, which is the uh, ratio of chipstone to pottery, to cooking pottery. Uh, so I'll, I'll focus mostly on A and B for today. Um, what you can see here is that I have those yellow circles representing the, the mean relationship between population and pottery consumption. Uh, for each of a series of time periods. Uh, I only sh show three of them in different colors for the individual dots, but the data are, you know, there's like 10 or 12 different time periods represented there. Each one has a yellow circle. And the same thing for house size uh, in B. And what you can see is that all of those means, you know, line up along the same fit line over a roughly four century period. Uh, where so unlike the case in China, where those circ those centers would be migrating up over time, in this case they just they just kind of wander around on a single uh, relationship, tracking the changes in the average agglomeration levels of the society over time, and that's true in both measures of consumption and of personal possessions. You can see that on the right side for A and B. So the purple line is the intercept of the baseline rate of consumption uh, of, po of decorated pottery over time. And you can see it's a flat line, basically. You know, there's really no consistent change in the intercept of that scaling relation over time. And the blue line above is the same data for the uh, house size uh, series. And again, there's this weird little blip there, but basically it's a, it's a straight, a flat line. Uh, and so in, in, all, most cases where we have data, uh, we have not seen a clear example of uh, uh, an increase in the level of a scaling relationship over time. They, they seem, basically societies seem to be uh, just moving around on a single relationship over many, many, many centuries. Now there's one exception to this where we have started to see evidence of potentially uh, uh, societies where the height of scaling relationships began to increase uh, consistently over time, and that is uh, the ancient Roman world. Uh, here are some data from uh, Roman Britain, which uh, the, the top uh, series here shows you the, uh, the exponent of the relationship between population and the rate of coin loss. So the density of coins in excavations relative to the density of houses is basically what's being measured here. Now, during the late Iron Age, coins were not really, probably not used for economic transactions as they were in the Roman era. So they don't, you don't necessarily need to pay attention to those. But during the Roman period, you can see that the relationship between uh, population and, and coin loss rates is pretty consistently around, again, this magic number of uh, 1.16 or 76. Uh, but if you look at the intercept of those relationships over three different periods of the Roman era, in Britain, uh, you can see that there's a consistent increase in the intercept, the height of the scaling relation over time. And those numbers on the in the uh, dots below show the number of sites on which these the relationship is based. And you can see the same thing looking at data for uh, the the rate of consumption of fineware pottery, uh, Samian ware, and uh, other color coded wares, other things like that. Uh, again, consistency in the exponent of the relationship uh, over time, uh, but in a consistent increase in the height of the scaling relationship over the centuries. So it may well be that this, you know, if you think of a second major trans, the first major transition being the emergence of, uh, uh, of economies of scale in areas of settlements and increasing returns in socioeconomic rates. And the second, the second major transition would be, would be consistent growth in the height of the intercept of these scaling relationships. You know, it may have first emerged in the Roman world. Uh, it may be there in other societies too, and it's just hard to measure. It could be, it could be that, the, that the rates of change are so modest that it's hard to see them in, in archeological data. But uh, so far, uh, this, is, this is where we're at. All right, the fifth uh, major result um, that we've come to is that 
we think that this theory is well developed enough that the exceptions to it are actually pretty interesting. And I think this is an important uh, thing to, to talk about for a second. In, in many areas of the natural sciences where, where uh, formal mathematical theories are better developed than they are in the social sciences, you know, for example, in physics, people want to find a result that is not, does not meet with, let's say, the expectations of general relativity. Physicists would be excited to get a result that does not match because it tells us that there's something missing from general relativity that we need to work on to improve the theory. Uh, and we think that the evidence of nonlinear scaling is, is robust enough and consistent enough and widespread enough, and that our theory that seeks to explain it is reasonable enough that when we see exceptions to the rule, we think they're interesting and important and they help us to extend the theory. So here's one example. These are data from the classic Maya world of uh, southern, southern Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. Uh, the relationship between population and area across many different regions uh, is shown at the top. And you can see from the slope of that line, it's 1.3. So the exponent of the relationship between population and area is 1.3. That means that larger Maya settlements are less dense than smaller ones, more like hunting and gathering societies. So what's going on there? Uh, well, first of all, it obviously means that the people in these settlements were not arranging themselves to balance the costs and benefits of interactions with others. They were doing it in a way that balanced something else. Um, now, one thing that archeologists have noted is that in classic Maya settlements, most houses are arranged with, far, with fields immediately surrounding them. And so you have to imagine there being a core with the temples in it, and then a very large area where there's individual farms and, and fields uh, surrounding that. What that means is that the effective area of social mixing where the population is moving all around inside a container is actually the epicenter of the settlement uh, where all the temples and plazas are and where probably the periodic markets were. Uh, and that, you might expect then the people of these settlements to have gone there maybe once a week at least to uh, go to market and get other things that they need and to interact in the center of town. And so when you think about it that way, all of a sudden you do see the expected relationship. Uh, so the lower plot there B shows the populations of these settlements against the area of the epicenter in the center of the settlement rather than the whole area. Uh, and what you see here is the familiar sublinear scaling between two thirds and five six. Uh, so here's an example where there's on the surface an exception to the rule, but if you put it all together, it actually shows you something that's even more interesting, which shows you that actually it's the social reactor process that's fundamental, not necessarily the way it plays out in any specific society with the way that people arrange themselves in space. Uh, Sixth major takeaway is that, uh, and I think this is a pretty important point I wanna emphasize here. The effects of the social reactors process that we found seem to be, they are on average. So there's an average effect of scale uh, and they are in aggregate across entire settlements, you know, on average across all of the people in a settlement. So far, the theory does not specify how the returns to scale are distributed among a population. So if you just think about an average, there's a variety of different distributions that would give you the same average. So if the benefits of scale and the costs are, are experienced on average across and in aggregate in a population, that doesn't tell you much about the way those benefits and costs are distributed among the population in that settlement. And what that tells you is really, I think this sets up a very key and probably fundamental conflict in, in history and in probably even in human societies more generally. And that is the relationship between the benefits of scale, or let's say the, you know, increasing the benefits of scale relative to the costs, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the distribution of those benefits across the population. Uh, so as you might imagine, if, if you lived in a society where uh, you, you know, people agglomerated into one big city, but all the proceeds from that went to the king and not to everyone else, that society would not be very stable, I would think, because people wouldn't put up with it. Uh, so there's a tension here between uh, the organization that it takes to, to increase the scale of a human society, the inequality that comes with it, and the benefits that come from it, and that these things are not necessarily 
necessarily in sync and they can often lead to conflict. All right, the final thing I'd say is that, you know, there's a lot more to do. Uh, we've, I think we've made a lot of progress in understanding this, the social reactor process, uh, defining it, seeing how it works, seeing how it's evolved, but there's a lot more to do. Uh, one area has to do with collecting better data so that we can look more carefully at the deviations from the expected values in individual cities. So this is an example using contemporary data. In the upper left, uh, this is uh, again, uh, US MSAs, you can see the familiar relationship between population and wages. You can see the yellow square is the center of the relationship. It's, it's migrating over time. But of course, in any given time period, uh, individual cities don't fall right on the fit line. They have a residual to the fit line. Uh, and those residuals are interesting. In contemporary data, the presumption would be that the residual of a, of a metro area to one of these fit lines is a meaningful deviation. It reflects something, it's not just that you couldn't measure it well enough, it's that there really is a difference between what's going on in each of these cities and relative to the average. So in D of this uh, slide here, you can see a time series of the residual of specific cities to the scaling relation between population and wages. And uh, as you can see, for example, Silicon Valley really stands out as having a positive residual relative to the average trend. So there's something, even after you account for the effects of scale, there's something special going on in Silicon Valley that makes it more productive uh, than the average city, like for example, New York or Los Angeles, which after you control for scale uh, is pretty typical. Uh, the issue is that in archeological data, it's often pretty hard to know if what we're measuring, uh, if the deviations from a scaling relationship reflect real deviations or reflect just measurement error or imprecision, time averaging, all the sorts of things that we know are involved in archeological data. Uh, so this is one example from a study that uh, John Hansen and I worked on together. Uh, it's the relationship between the number of residents in a Roman city and the capacity of the amphitheater uh, in which uh, periodic political and social events took place. And in the lower uh, right, we have the distribution of the residuals of the individual cities to the average relationship after controlling for scale. Uh, and again, I think a lot of these really, it's probably more measurement error, error in the number of residents than it would be in the capacity of the theaters because the theaters are pretty cut and dry in many cases. Uh, but you know, there's some hints that maybe some of these residuals are meaningful. For example, uh, the, they're, they're color-coded according to their civic status. And there's a little bit more red on the positive side of the residuals. And there's a little bit more green for a municipia on the negative side of the residuals. So there's a suggestion of a trend there uh, that may reflect something about uh, the local context of individual cities that led to them producing more amphitheater space or less than you might expect uh, given their size. But again, I think this is pretty tentative still and we just need better data. Another thing uh, that I think is important to investigate further is thinking about these scaling intercepts and why they change over time. Uh, we understand the interpretation of it, for example, with contemporary data that uh, the GDP per capita or the baseline GDP of a person is increasing over time as these scaling relations increase. Uh, but what exactly does that mean? What are the things that contribute to that change? And can we actually measure those and take this, take this analysis a step further? So on this slide, um, I've shown you the, the way the theory spins out, the math spins out for what the intercept of a scaling relation uh, would be determined by. That's the upper equation there. And you can rearrange it to solve for this mythical value G, which reflects the average energetic benefit of a social interaction. Uh, and uh, so you can start working on trying to measure these other uh, parameters of uh, the intercepts of scaling relationships. Uh, I'm involved in a project right now where we're trying to do that using uh, the distribution patterns of pottery produced in specific kilns in uh, Roman Britain. This is just a map of the database that we're working with uh, to try and see if we can actually estimate, put a number on this value of transport costs, uh, the epsilon of this relation here. So perhaps begin to explain uh, the changing height of scaling relations that we've seen uh, for Britain during the Roman era. We haven't done that much with uh, information and diversity yet. I think there's more to be done here and there's some mysteries about it. 
Um, this is one result that we, is just emerging from our study of the data from Roman Britain. Uh, it shows the familiar uh, in, uh, returns to scale in the information that the average consumer was able to integrate in making decisions about uh, what pottery to buy and use uh, in their daily life. Uh, so the way to think about this is that in larger settlements in the Roman era, um, consumers integrated more information about pottery from their social network, uh, and that that information is reflected in the uh, the Shannon diversity index of the pottery that was consumed by the people in these settlements. So a consistent slope there that is consistent with uh, connectivity, at least. Um, but the intercept of the relation here is changing over time. So what you see is it goes from 1.2 down to 0.76 over the course of the Roman era. That's reflecting probably increasing specialization in production as the scale and scope of the economy expanded. Um, so, okay, we've got that. But in other cases, you might not necessarily expect information to show increasing returns to scale as it seems to show here. Uh, if you think about you know, what individuals know in a society, well, a portion of what an individual knows is going to be things that they know uniquely. Uh, and then a portion of what the whole society knows is gonna be what you know uniquely plus what the next person knows uniquely plus the next person. And that's only going to be a fraction, you know, each, the, what I know is only it, that is uniquely mine is, is a small amount of what I know. A lot of what I know is stuff that you also know. Uh, and so it's not necessarily clear that information necessarily increases uh, in a super linear fashion with population. Uh, we need more, more analysis and measurements of, of these sorts of things to make progress there. Um, there's opportunities to connect what we're doing with the other so-called laws of geography. And uh, this is just one example. So if you think about it, in contemporary data, if the height of a scaling relationship is changing over time, if it's growing up like this, it means that the populations and GDPs of, of cities are growing. Well, if, if they're both grow, if they're growing, how is it that the scaling could be preserved and consistent uh, through time? It would, could only happen if the rate of growth of individual settlements is independent of how large the settlement is. Uh, and uh, this relationship between population and growth is something known as Gibrat's law uh, from geography. And there are data that support uh, that conclusion. Uh, here's again, data for contemporary MSAs that shows that the rate of growth uh, in population, at least of these, of these uh, settlements over the past two decades is independent of their population at the beginning of the period of time that they're being measured. So we haven't been able to see this yet with archeological data. We haven't tried real hard yet, but I think there's more work to be done to see how much, how, the extent to which Gibrat's law is connected to uh, the social reactors process that we're working on. Finally, as I, as I well, not finally, but also as I alluded to before, um, the relationship between scaling and inequality is important. Uh, so here's uh, again, returning to data from the uh, Rio Grande Pueblos, the, 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 the register above A shows an estimate of the economic growth rate based on the, again, pottery consumption rates uh, in that society, which as I've already shown you was basically a predictable function of the agglomeration rate, the, the average size of settlements in that society. Um, over time and changes in that average over time. And then the bottom uh, register B shows the Gini coefficient of the uh, room sizes uh, in these villages um, over time. And, you know, maybe, you know, if you read the tea leaves carefully enough, you might see some tenant suggestions of a relationship, but it's really not very close. Uh, so whether there's even any kind of predictability in the relationship between uh, scaling growth and inequality or not, I would say is an open question uh, that needs more work. Finally, there's really been hardly any work on these topics uh, using archeological evidence. Uh, relationship between scale and energy, rates of violence, disease, health, sustainability, and so forth. There's a whole lot of properties of past human societies that are measurable that uh, should be investigated, I think, from this perspective. So let's summarize where I think we've come to uh, through this project. Um, we really do think that, that 
what we call settlement scaling theory emerging from, uh, from this project. Uh, we really do think that it's the beginnings of a real predictive theory of human societies as complex systems. Um, I realize that this is a bold claim to make, um, but uh, I really do think that the, the way in which we go about measuring these things, the style of analysis, the processes that it reveals, the regularity and ubiquity of these processes suggest that there really is some a predictable theory here uh, to pursue. This approach applies equally well to the past and present. Hopefully you've even lost track of when I'm talking about modern data versus archeological data in this presentation. And that is the point. Uh, you know, we think that this is an approach that uh, applies equally well to uh, societies we know through the archeological record as well as to today. Now the approach, what it does is it control, in a sense controls for the effects of scale so that other factors involved in the evolution of human societies can come into greater focus and can be a, a, a subject for study in their own right. Uh, and this is important, right? A lot of the changes that have happened in history are simply results of scale, they're scale effects. So we need to control for those effects before we can move on to other things that were important. And we think that this approach allows you to do that. This approach, I think, I think, I hope I convinced you that this approach requires archeological evidence to flesh it out and extend it. Uh, these exceptions to the rule that we see through the archeological record are really interesting and they help us to understand the social reactor process better than we would if we stuck only to uh, modern urban areas or you know, modern industrial capitalism and so forth. So there's an important role for archeology span in building this theory that applies to all of us, including now. And I hope you can see that I think there's the germ of practical relevance for uh, you know, the process of sustainable human development that we're all concerned about today uh, in these processes. Uh, we're all grappling with how to deal with the changing climate and to produce societies or encourage societies to be more resilient. What we would say is that any proposed solutions that, that imply a contradiction with the social reactor process are unlikely to work uh, because uh, this process seems to be such an intrinsic component of human affairs. So that's a summary of the project and the things we've learned. Thanks for listening. Um, before we go, I just wanted to show you the uh, uh, URL of the website uh, one more time. And I also wanted to uh, just mention that um, uh, you know, I think that this kind of work is a good example of something that I call collaborative synthesis, which is uh, uh, close working, close collaborative research involving uh, researchers from many different disciplines where the products are products that no one person could imagine producing on their own. And uh, if you like that style of work, well, there's a center now that's dedicated to it. It's called the Center for Collaborative Synthesis and Archaeology. Uh, we just started it at CU uh, a year or so ago. Uh, and we have a partner organization called the Coalition for Archaeological Synthesis, which is a, uh, a not-for-profit uh, uh, private organization that is a membership-based organization that uh, each of you could join if you would like to be more involved in this kind of work. And you can see the website to the center that will get you into uh, that realm here on the slide as well. Uh, so thanks very much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Amazing, really good, excellent talk. Um, I think I'm going to take um, complete. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to completely um, misuse my power as host, and I'm going to take. I'm going to ask the first question, um, and that is considering the um, the actual spatial distribution of um, a, a civilization or a city. How much do you think, or do you know, shape affects um, this social re social reactor that you're talking about? In terms of if if, if a city is um, limited by geographic features, yeah, does that have much of an effect on the actual um, network sizes? Yeah, that that is a great question. Um... <sighs> A, a, a postdoc that worked on this project uh, in the past, uh, Jack Hansen, has a data set of Roman cities uh, where 
We can look at relationship between population and area, for example. Some of them have well-defined road grids and some of them are much more organic in their layouts. Um, haven't published any studies along those lines about the effects of the geometry and spatial patterns of the cities for their scaling. Um, I suspect that if we saw a strong pattern, we would have published it already. I have a feeling that we looked and didn't see it. That doesn't mean it's not there. It might mean that we can't, it's just not measurable using those kinds of data. What I would say is that um, some collaborators on the project have been working with data from uh, informal settlements in the world today, uh, informally known as slums, um, where they've been examining the, uh, the effects of, in a sense, not enough uh, infra interaction area or infrastructural area, uh, not enough pathways for people to move around and mix uh, in, in those kinds of settlements for the, for the living standards of the people who, uh, who are, are forced to live there. Um, so there are some indications, yes, that that's going on. Um, I think something else that we also know uh, from our own experience is that urban centers that were laid out based on a previous transportation technology tend to be smaller, denser, have smaller streets. They're actually in many cases easier to, work, to walk around inside of than they are to drive through. Whereas many more recently built cities in America, for example, are actually easier to drive through than to walk through. <laughs> um, so I do think that there are, in a sense, legacy effects of the transportation technology embedded in the built environments of cities that has an effect on their functioning. Um, but I think that's an example of an area where I think, uh, again, it needs more work. It'd be great to see that shown rather than just talk about qualitatively. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. So we do have one question from Walter. Um, he asked it very early on. Um, in any of the scaling analyses, have you taken into an account the role of the internet on settlements? Uh, yeah, this is a very common, commonly asked question. Um, what I would say is that as long as human beings still have to physically get their food from somewhere, that the scale effects that we, I've been talking about will still have to be there. Um, now, once, once what, what is that Star Trek uh, technology, the, the food creator thingy where you just say, I want, I want soup and it you know, creates the soup out of nothing. Yeah. Sure, when we can, you know, once we can get our food over the internet, probably things will change. Uh, but, but as long as we need physical things and have to physically get them from somewhere, um, I think that these scale effects will continue. Now, I mean, I suppose you could say, well, what if, what if grocery shopping becomes Amazon Prime delivery for all of us and there's no more grocery stores and it's just a network of uh, Amazon trucks that deliver our food to us every day? Um, the scaling would still be there, but it might not be reflected in cities anymore you know, when, if that were to occur, at least according to the theory, that's the way I would, I would think about it. Yeah, very interesting. Um, we've got another one in the, uh, in the chat from, from John Gowlett. Um, have you done much on the social friction, the scaling of social friction and violence? Yeah, yeah. So, so this, is a, this is a key point. So there has been some work uh, using uh, crime statistics from contemporary data uh, and I, I believe I have a, a link to one or two of those studies at, at the Social Reactors Project website. We haven't looked at um, rates of violence in archaeological data uh, yet, so I can't say for sure. You know, some of these things come into thinking about an important question that I didn't address here is, okay, well, let's say that productivity with scale is intrinsic. Well, then why doesn't everyone just collapse into, a, you know, a singularity of one giant, you know, one giant black hole city, you know, that all of us live in uh, together. Um, there's obviously limits on, on how big a city can be that has to do with the way, the way that the costs of agglomeration interact with the benefits. So in addition to increasing uh, productivity of interactions, there's also increasing uh, sewage, <laughs> needs for getting rid of sewage. There's increasing infectious disease and other things that you would expect to impact human health. And so at some stage, the health, de the health detriments of agglomeration are gonna over probably overcome the, uh, the economic benefits of agglomeration. And figuring out where those points are, I think is an, is an important frontier for research in this area. And of course, what that also means is that 
after a certain point for cities to continue growing, they have to deal with uh, sanitation and other kinds of issues that come up when people live in, in larger units. So I would think that that sort of analysis would be crucially important for thinking about, for example, why was Rome able to be a, a city of a million people without modern technology 2000 years ago? Surely they had to solve some problems that had not been solved in earlier cities that kept them from being able to grow larger. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Um, are there any other questions? Um, anyone would like to ask a question out loud, anything like that? Anything at all? Oh, Rob, go for it. Um, Scott, um, one of the implications of, of, of the theory is we, t we tend to talk um, for, in the modern world and for, for many past societies, make a major distinction between urban areas and rural. A consequence of what you're talking about is actually they belong on a continuum. That's surely got major implications for how social theory today and how we organise our societies as well. Can you talk a bit more about what that continuum might mean? Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, it's one of the it's one of the difficult air aspects of this work uh, in the way it's being uh, digested uh, out there in the world is. Um, the original observations that led to the identification of these relationships was looking at data from cities. And the initial research teams that were interested in these processes were focused on cities and their successes and failures and so on, potential and problems. Um, but yet, as we have gone to look at archeological data, we've seen the same effects in communities that are orders of magnitude smaller than anything you would call a city. Uh, so again, what I think it shows you is that the social reactor process is intrinsic of course, what happens is as, it get, as agglomerations get bigger and bigger, there's emergent properties that are made feasible by the uh, uh, increases in diversity and specialization that go along with it. Um, but one thing that's also interesting is that you can only see these processes, you can't see these processes in every kind of settlement that there is. So for example, um, in the world today, we actually have a hard time seeing them in micropolitan areas, uh, very small areas in, a, in the contemporary world. Is that because a micropolitan area doesn't capture the reactor in which people are interacting as well as a metro area does? Is it because you know, the network of those people isn't necessarily well characterized by a container even in space, but there's more like this web that flies out all over the place? Um, are the incomes generated by people in a micropolitan area not related to social interactions? And it's just like, maybe it's mostly farming, for example, which would have operate under different rules. Um, I would say we don't know the answers to those questions, but I think it's quite interesting that we see scaling effects in, in, in villages, in the archeological and ethnographic record on the order of hundreds of people and smaller, but we don't seem to see those in contemporary uh, settlements of the same size. So there might be a minimal threshold below which these effects are not apparent. I'm not sure what that is yet. Um, or, I, I, you know, again, this is an area where I think there just needs to be a lot more work. Excellent. Perfect. So um, I think we'll do one more because we're all running over quite quite a bit. Is that all right with you, Scott, for the one more? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, Adam Green, do you have? Yes, uh, thanks. Thank social reactors uh, literature in one in one bit. Um, I'm just wondering if you if you'd like to uh, expand a bit on your thoughts on why the social reactors process begins in some contexts and not in others. So, it, was, it did, did you detect any meaningful differences between the context where it sort of worked and was explanatory, and those that it didn't? I'm just wondering. There is, there is a hint of this in the data from the Basin of Mexico that I showed uh, early on in the presentation. Um, the archaeologists that did the survey of the Basin of Mexico distinguished between you know, villages, towns, cities, you know, things where you might expect people to have arranged themselves with respect to other people more than with respect to productive resources, for example. I'm not saying those people weren't farmers, but if they were, they probably commuted out to their farms each day rather than, you know, had their farms in between each other. But some of the settlements from that survey are more like rancheria type settlements where there's 
uh, a family farmstead and then farms and then the next one and the next one and the next one. But they're contiguous so that you can still, in a sense, draw a boundary around it. Um, so those, those uh, rancheria type settlements, again, don't show densification with scale the way that the villages and towns do. Um, so there is within the same society, again, some of the settlements show it and others don't. And which ones do seems to depend upon whether what the logic behind the arrangement of people in space was. Uh, so you can definitely say that this process is not, was not, uh, was not most important for the arrangement of people in these rancheria type settlements. That's also true uh, for Maya settlements, for example. Uh, but yet in the case of, of Maya cities, again, that process was taken into account, it appears at least, uh, intuitively in the scaling of the, uh, the epicenter areas where people would in a kind of a radial pattern go periodically to interact and mix in the center of town. Uh, so these effects are very widespread. They don't always occur. They don't always occur today even, uh, but we think that the, the, the processes involved in generating them when we see them you know, are some are kind of an emergent intuitive property of human beings uh, doing what they do uh, on a landscape. Great, thank you. Perfect, excellent. Is that the, uh, the last question? Perfect. So thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, very interesting talk. Sorry it ran over, but it was really good. Thanks for that, Scott. That was amazing. Um, yes, again, impressed by this entire theory, this body of theory. Um, so thank you very much for coming. And uh, please keep your eyes out for the video on the YouTube channel as well. Um, and we've also got an excellent talk next week. So sign up for that one as well. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. And we'll Thanks see for you. coming everyone. It's great to see you. Have a great day. <laughs>